Welcome to Her Love of Sports with your host, Katie Hamilton. Hey everyone, welcome to Her Love of Sports, where we are highlighting and promoting professional women in sports. So let's kick it off. Joining me today, member of the Canadian Women's National Soccer Team since 2004, three-time Olympian, two-time Olympic bronze medalist, and doctor of chiropractic, Melissa Tan Creddy. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. I'm super excited to dive into your career. So let's get started and just tell us about how you started in the soccer world. Yeah, I think I was a pretty energetic kid. And I think my parents were tired of me just like ripping around the house and in the backyard. So they, they definitely threw me in a bunch of sports. Uh, I mean, t-ball, I started at track and then soccer was my last one. And I think what happened was I wasn't really into the individual part of sports. I loved the team feeling of it. Uh, and I got nervous a lot with track. I loved it, but I got too nervous with track. And I think that's when I kind of made the choice of going full on with soccer, really wanted to get into that team. And I love my teammates. So that's what made me choose soccer. And how old were you when you started? I started when I was four years old. Four. Wow. So starting early. And were yeah. you over in Ontario when you started? Is that That's where you were born, right? Yep. I was in Ontario, started in Ancaster, Ontario, and played house league until I was 13 years old, which is usually not the track that most kids go to right now, especially if you want to be successful. But I uh, played house league till I was 13. And that's when I was kind of asked by a coach to move up and try out a rep team. And from there, that's where my career basically started. I think that's really good to know because so many kids, um, especially like me coaching right now, is they want to get onto that elite team right away. And sometimes they're saying, hey, you got to join us at eight or nine years old. So it's great to hear that you played house till you were 13 years old and still made it and tried out for the rep team and made it to the national team. Um, so you yeah. and then you transitioned and you got a scholarship to Notre Dame University. Is that correct? Correct. So yep. how, how was that uh, playing university there? I know that you uh, had won a national championship and you were the captain of the team. So kind of just how was your experience at university and being a Div 1 athlete as well as a student? Well, it definitely started off rough. I think it was two weeks before my freshman year even began. I tore my ACL. So I was out for all of my freshman year. And, and that's hard, right? Just first time away from home, you know, the transition into university school is so hard. You don't know anyone, you know, leaving your friends and family. I think I, it was definitely rough for the first semester. And my GPA spoke that as well, kind of reflected that. And uh, it took me about a year to kind of get comfortable around the campus and, and with the team and the girls are great and the coaching staff is great. And I mean, just seeing, I think the best thing about that, there's two things. The one is that I could see from, you know, sitting on the sidelines, see what, what it took to be at that level and, and see some of these girls that, you know, were, were studs, Herman Trophy winners, you know, national team athletes already to see what it took to be at that level and how they train consistently and, and to see that live, you know, in action. i never seen anyone like that, like uh, basically a whole team of studs. Um, and, th and that kind of like got me going and, and knew, I knew in my head that I, I needed to prepare well and really take care of my knee and my rehab process because I had a big step to fill and to step up into this next level of soccer. I mean, the, the Div 1 experience was unlike anything I could ever imagine. I feel like if I were to do it again, I would 100% volunteer to do it again. Mm -hmm. I, I had such a great time. The school is fantastic. We ended up winning a national championship. And this is, this is the second great thing about tearing my ACL is that I took that year off. So that last year got put onto my fifth year. And that was the year that we won. That was the year I got the captain. So, wow. I mean, so many great things that came out of that. Basically getting to like watch it from the sidelines and, and mature and also just getting a national championship out of it. Wow, that's amazing. So what was, going back to your injury, what was that like having the injury and then the process of, of recovery? Um, because I know that it can kind of be um, heartbreaking and make you kind of question sometimes, do I continue? Or So how was that experience for you? Yeah, and at that time, you know, I'm, I was born in 81. So at that time, you know, sports science wasn't a thing and ACLs were season ending or career ending at that time. And um, mine was actually a partial tear. So that was kind of the tricky part of it. I, I know my mom, 
she had a reaction to it and she thought my career was over. And we've heard so many horror, horror stories of, you know, schools basically just rescinding your scholarship mm-hmm. and being like, listen, yeah. you know, we can't take you on. Uh, but they, I was lucky enough to still have my full ride. And uh, I went there with a brace, you know, fully rehabbed and hoping that I would get out there and play. And it was my first day out on the field and I was cutting and I remember watching practice at the same time and I ended up fully tearing it again. So, wow. and my surgery was that week. The rehab of ACL, anyone that's been through that rehab, it's grueling. It, it actually is a year and it's a year of, you know, it could be four months. So you're running, but it's a year of actually reconnecting the neurologic parts of everything from moving your leg to running to kicking all the little finesse kicks and passes that you used to have you just have you don't have that connection anymore so it's recreating that connection it can become very frustrating at times uh painful at times but it's a it's a patient kind of rehab and it's something that is pretty much mastered now Mm -hmm. and I was very thankful to have a great surgeon a great team behind me and came out I mean I'm knock on wood in 2021 no no injuries since um and no issues with it since but Definitely one that takes a while. And I see with my patients now that you, you need the, the psychological team behind you as well, the mental team behind you to kind of keep you in the game and keep you going and keep you pushing through things. Right. So what advice would you give to girls who are balancing both their education and being an athlete? It's hard. It's extremely hard. Um, and it's going to be some days you just can't do both and you're going to have to choose and you're going to have to give and take. Uh, but in the end, it makes you such a, a better person. I can prioritize much better. You know, I can create goals and really reach them quicker and just have my my life and world organized. I feel like it forces you to kind of jump into that. Um, and when people ask me, you know, would you would you do that again? Honestly, I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> but I don't regret a thing. It's it's one of the most difficult things to do because you it's hard as a, as an athlete or someone who excels at school. You want to be a, not a perfectionist, but you want to be great at everything. You want to, and it's hard to see one side of it slide. So if I was doing well in school, obviously my soccer would decrease. If I was doing well in soccer, obviously my school I wasn't giving enough time to school. So it's just accepting that balance and know that it's more about the long run than the short little results that you're getting. Absolutely. And I think that's key for people who are going through injuries is to kind of look at it long term and that it's not such a quick process to get right back in there and make sure that you do go through the the full healing process. Um, So let's uh, jump in. So the 2012 Olympics in London. So one of the most exciting and incredible games in women's soccer ever. Canada versus USA semifinals, high scoring game, 4 3, over 120 minutes played, and you went into extra time. So, Canada opened up the scoring sheet. Uh, the ball was played into you at the top of the 18. You laid it off to Christine Sinclair, who dekes past the US defense, slots at bottom corner. What was the feeling making that play and scoring the first goal of the game against such a powerhouse of the USA? Honestly, no one's asked that question. And I feel like that's such an important question because, I mean, one, it's we hardly score against the U.S. at that Mm -hmm. time. And for us to do it first, I think it was one of the few times we ever had to do it first in an Olympic semifinal game. And I think that game was so big. It was the first time we've ever been in semifinals. And to be able to lead the world champion, it was almost like a puff your chest moment. It was like, okay, here we go. We got this. Like everything's kind of you know, we're putting everything into place. And it was kind of a power move, you know, like we're putting a stamp on this. We kind of caught them off guard. And yeah, I think that was a massive, massive shift in that game, really setting us off. I think it was like the 30th minute. So it mm-hmm. felt fantastic yeah. to get on the board. And uh, and then you also assisted the second goal because uh, you Canada scored Sinclair. They came back to tie it up. And then a second goal, um, it was a beauty cross uh, by yourself uh, from, I believe, the left wing. Uh, Sinclair heads it in. She went to score a hat trick. And ultimately, the States came back and won the game in extra time. But what were you feeling when that final whistle blew at the end of the game? Yeah. Uh, heartbreak. Dejected. I mean, I thought we had that game. I thought that was our game to win, obviously. I thought that was our chance to go to a gold medal game. If not, even just to hold it at a time to go into PKs. I felt so confident. Mm -hmm. And to kind of give up that last goal the way it happened, that's a hard one to get over. And, you know, in the time that it happened, it was like the last bit of extra added time and extra time. Like, it's just crazy. You can't write it that way. 
So I feel like it was like a billion stabs in the heart and just like, you just felt at a loss. Like you can't even put it into words. I was angry at first. And then very shortly after I was walking off the field and saw my family and I just lost it. I just couldn't stop crying. Wow. I know. I still, still thinking about that game, even though it was 2012, I still get goosebumps. I was still in my youth playing back then. And I remember watching it and I just got so pumped and just wanting yeah. to go out and just, just start practicing <laughs> and like channel my inner tan credit. It was such a great game. It. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> um, and so let's go in. So it was your second Olympic appearance in 2012 in London. Uh, so Canada, you did go and you won the bronze medal in a historic performance. Amazing. Um, after that, you took two years off from the national team and focused on your education and degrees. So what was like that step? Uh, what was that like stepping away from the national team for two years to focus on your other career? And why did you choose that? Well, I didn't have a choice. My school, they were kind enough to let me do this anyways. They kind of um, bent the rules, let's just say. And I was in a five-year program and I started in 2006 and that was six years later. And I still, I was hardly even halfway through. Um, and they gave me a call and they were like, listen, you, that's fantastic that you're doing so well, but you either need to come back and finish your schooling or you're going to have to start all over again. And that was what made the decision for me. There's no way I was starting all over again. I mean, I put so much hard work into that, into that career already and my schooling already. So I had to go back. What it felt like is exactly what it sounded like. It was so hard. That that tournament was probably my biggest, best tournament. It was like my prime of my career. I was playing so well. I was at a high. Um, I mean, no one wants to step away from sport at a high. And, you know, after you're 30, it's kind of, you know, hard to keep with the body. You're up against so many obstacles. And I was just, you know, I had no choice. And I was just like focused on school. And I knew after the two and a half years, I was going to try try to come back for the World Cup in 2015. That was on my mind. And I mean, one of the hardest decisions I've had to make. make and I was talking about this recently, actually. I, I've always wondered, you know, not a regret, but wondered, curiosity, what my career would have done if I didn't go to school. What could have happened from there? You know, where could I have been by 2015? Because I was working from zero basically to try and make that team in 2015. So it was hard. My body was falling apart. Mm -hmm. You know, I went from nine hours in school and in clinic to trying to come back and play high performance when everyone else was still training at the highest level. So I and tore my calf, you know, my threw out my back. So lots of fun soft tissue injuries. <laughs> So it was quite a big uh, road to 2015 and trying to make that the Canadian national team again. So it wasn't just, hey, I'm taking a hiatus for a bit, see you in a few years. It was you need to kind of retry out for the Canadian national team. Yeah, I feel like I, I technically always had a, a, an option to try out or option for a roster spot. I think, you know, it was a flip of a coin, what kind of physical specimen they're going to get out of me after school. <laughs> And I think they saw right away that I, I was struggling and I was struggling physically and mentally just to, you know, I was out of the game for so long. The game had changed itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I knew right away that I had a, a tough, you know, journey, let's say, to get back on that team. The good thing was John kept most of that 2012 team together, mostly because, you know, he, he knew that there was this camaraderie there. He went off, he didn't have a new uh, group of players coming in yet. There was a lot of young players still trickling in. Um, and then he tried his best. We tried our best with that team. And I was lucky enough to make the spot. I feel like I was probably one of the last <laughs> start of the 11 that made it for sure. Um, and then I just was probably functioning at 60%. And I be honest and say that I was, I tried my best to get there. It took about a year to get my fitness back and kind of get back into the swing of things. So it definitely was a, a tryout. It wasn't anything that was promised to me or anything like that, but I knew, I think I was so hell bent on coming back that no one was going to stop me. I love it. Um, so also, so when I was reading, when you were taking time off and doing your school, uh, you graduated with honors and were also the valedictorian of your class. Yes. So that's pretty huge. You take your years off, you go to your <laughs> school and you just go full force into it. Hey, just don't do anything half, you know, I got to go full in. <laughs> I think that's, that's the best part of life, right? Why give a half effort? I was all full in and I wanted to be the best. And, <laughs> you know, where's competition? Now school's competition. So every time I got that test grade, I was like, did I beat everyone? So, yeah, it was, it was about being the best that I could be. And 
obviously I knew that I took everything seriously and, and um, I wanted to be the best practitioner once I was done and make sure that I got everything I could out of that schooling. So definitely a little bit competitive for sure. It just shows that you can have both uh, the athletics as well as the smarts and yeah, absolutely amazing. So currently you work with athletes from every level and you understand what it takes to compete at the highest level and stay healthy. I try to talk to this about, uh, with my athletes I'm coaching, but how important is it for athletes to take care of themselves, especially with all the physical demands of being active? I think that's the number one thing people don't think of, you know, even if I think about near the end of my career, I played, you know, up until I was 34 and I could tell you that my prep, my recovery, my prehab was probably longer than my time on field. And, you know, that's everything from sleep, mental preparation to nutrition, um, to my activation prior to, to my cool down after it's like my auxiliaries, like the list goes on and on and on. And that's what keeps you in the game. And that's what keeps you in form. I think what happens here is we get so driven to, you know, the performance part of it, but we forget about what keeps you performing and keeps you maintaining that level. And it's all the stuff outside of the field that you have to kind of master. And and the big part of that is the mental prep and the mental training. And especially at that level, if you don't have that, if you don't have that under control or someone that's helping you with that, then you can see yourself kind of get into those dips and you'll just keep dipping instead of crawling out of those. So yeah, the biggest part of telling my patients, you know, like with injuries, it's usually you're either overdoing it over and over again, or you're going from zero to 100 from nothing to I'm going to run a marathon, you know, which is pretty common in Vancouver. <laughs> People want to yeah. just get out there. So yeah, it's, it's all the other stuff that you don't think about that you definitely need a team or some guidance actually to help you stay healthy. Do you have a, is there an age so for cool down and for warm ups? I mean, I think that they're so important, just like you've mentioned, but there are some coaches and some teams that don't do that. Is there a specific age that you think that they should start doing their cool downs and their warm ups properly? Yeah, I think, you know, I just worked with um, an academy a couple of years back and I believe I was starting with the U8, you know, starting activation you know, it's movement prep, they all have brains, they all have nervous systems, they all have ligaments and tendons, you know, it's, it's about teaching them good habits, whether or not it's actually like, I know the difference between an eight year old and a 16 year old is massive, but it's teaching them good movement habits, it's it's teaching the brain that they can move like this, proper movements, proper techniques, not getting into those weird compensatory compensatory movements. Um, I mean, the younger, the better. I feel like when you're a baby, you're kind of innately born with movements, but then you kind of lose it with shoes and different walking or injuries. Kids have broken bones early on in ages. Um, These things can kind of change your gait and change things over time. I feel like if you're going to be training, and now kids train way more than I did as a kid, but if you're going to be training out there every day, why not? Why not have an activation of movement prep? Challenge them. Try something new. Not doesn't necessarily have to be sports specific but try something new, balance activity, anything. Fueling the body, I know is a big topic for kids because some kids come who are high uh, performance athletes that I coach and I'll ask them, hey, what did you have before the game? And they'll say something and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what you ate. So what are there any tips you would give to coaches on how they can teach their players uh, both the physical, mental, and as well for what you're fueling in your body? I would say the simplest form that was taught to me was if you are a beat up car, you know, you're putting in the worst type of gas, you're not really paying attention to it. But if you're a Ferrari and you want to move like a Ferrari, you need the team behind it. You need the best gas, you need the best pieces and parts. It's the same with food. You don't necessarily have to be too picky, but you're not going to go ahead and load yourself with high fats, fried food before any sort of performing activity. Um, I would say whole foods would be the easiest way. Carbs, a lot of kids, I don't know how it's happening with kids, but you know, they're, they're kind of getting, especially with girls, young girls, they're kind of getting the carb phobia. They don't want to eat carbs, but proper carbs and, you know, choosing the best carbs, not just, you know, bread, but you know, like sweet potatoes and rice. And that's, that's a great form. Oatmeal is a great form to fuel yourself. And then some form of protein uh, afterwards. 
I would say like protein shakes and that doesn't need to be done until you're older and an adult, but having some sort of, you know, anything right after a practice within 45 minutes, you know, whether, whether it be like dried fruit or some sort of bar or anything that you can get um, some food into you right after would help as well with the recovery process. But I wouldn't, I, you know, like nowadays I know it's about time management and, you know, just getting something into your kids as quick as possible. I've seen my sister with three of them, but there's easy, healthy choices that you can really have on the go. Uh, it doesn't have to be too complex, um, but try to stay away from anything processed before or after is what I would say. Great. Awesome. Okay. Last one for you. Top two sport career achievements. Woof. You're at top two. <laughs> Narrowing them down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Woo. I would say number one has to be the bronze medal 2012 Olympics. Definitely number one. I can't cheat and say number two would be Rio because it was. But if I'm going to go somewhere totally different, I would say definitely my scholarship to Notre Dame, just the way it set off my career and, you know, got a chance to make the national team from there and get noticed from there. Um, so I would say, you know, you know, one of the medals as number one, and then that scholarship to Notre Dame is number two, for sure. Awesome. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for being a guest on Her Love of Sports. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That is it for this episode of Her Love of Sports. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our special guest, Melissa Tancredi. To catch all the latest, make sure you follow us on social media at Her Love of Sports and check out herloveofsports.com. Special thanks to our mentor, Dave Shumka, Story High project manager, Sean Cathcart, and the National Screen Institute.